Tonight, push back against bills targeting the Texas LGBTQ community. You have a group of people who are unwilling to become educated. Uh, how do you combat that? Why some LGBTQ advocates say state lawmakers should stay out of the fight. Plus, more controversy from the Texas judge at the center of an abortion pill legal fight. He's accused of hiding part of his history from the U.S. Senate. And later, back in session, where a Texas U.S. senator stands in a fight to temporarily replace his longstanding colleague on a powerful committee. Capitol Tonight starts right now. This was the scene at the Texas Capitol this weekend. 1,500 people showed up to protest anti-LGBTQ bills moving through the state legislature. Thanks for joining us on Capitol Tonight. I'm Karina Kling. With just six weeks to go in the legislative session, the Senate's passed all of Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's priority bills focused on LGBTQ Texans. And late last week, a House committee advanced versions of bills to ban transgender youth from receiving gender-affirming care. Our Charlotte Scott reports on why one parent of a transgender youth does not think the legislature should be getting involved. Protect trans kids! Protect trans kids! It's a message that some Texans want lawmakers to hear, especially Sherry Brodell, who has a trans son. She requested that he not be shown or named for privacy and safety reasons. I'm here to stand up for what's right and that all Texans deserve to have equal rights and access to health care. Transgender children might choose to temporarily suppress puberty through the use of prescription medication. According to studies done by the University of Texas at Austin, puberty blockers can have positive and negative effects. They can decrease thoughts of suicide in adulthood, improve psychological functioning, and better someone's social life. At the same time, puberty blockers can slow down a child's growth. Who's capital? Rodell worries about her son's mental health if he's not eventually able to get gender affirming care. My child's risk of suicide or suicide ideation is increased exponentially because their access to mental health care is being taken away. It's terrifying. I live in fear of that every single day. But the Texas House, which has historically avoided legislation that would curb LGBTQ Texans' rights, is moving forward on some Senate-backed bills. A House panel advanced two measures to ban puberty blockers for minors. Trans children already receiving treatment would have to be weaned off of it if this legislation becomes law. Now now these bills could head to the House floor for a vote. Some conservatives support this move by lawmakers. I think it's very important to have this legislation to protect kids from the puberty blockers, but also the cross-sex hormones and even the surgeries that are happening, uh, because this is doing permanent damage to children uh, that can affect them their entire lives. Still, Brodell thinks the decision to use puberty blockers should be made with a doctor. Her son is not ready for the treatment yet, but when he is, Brodell wants the option. We are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure he has the support that he needs uh, to have a happy, healthy childhood. And if puberty blockers is part of it, that's a decision that I need to make with our child, with our doctors, and it does not belong in that building. For Capital Tonight, I'm Charlotte Scott. Charlotte, thank you. And while those anti-LGBTQ bills are moving forward, there has been bipartisan movement to repeal the state's unlawful sodomy ban. A House committee unanimously passed a bill this month that would repeal Texas's unconstitutional and unenforceable law criminalizing gay sex. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled the ban unconstitutional 20 years ago, but lawmakers have not removed the law from the books. Texas Democrats have tried to repeal it every session since with no luck but supporter, support has been growing slowly with Republican U.S. Senator Ted Cruz backing the effort last summer. With me now to discuss this further is the author of the bill, Representative Vetton Jones of Dallas. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Um, this bill has cleared one hurdle, voted out of committee. I mean, what's your reaction to the unanimous support for this bill, but also the, the road it faces in the House and, and in the Senate? Absolutely. Well, I think that it's, it's very clear that, that there's movement on this bill, but we know from the history of this bill that this bill still has a long way to go. 
And so we're continuing to work each and every day uh, to get this bill through the, the legislative process. Uh, we're now waiting to, to be able to hear this bill on the House floor. Uh, we're already working uh, with the Senate side, talking to senators about this very important bill. And just we're going to continue to work each and every day of this legislative session to make sure this gets across the finish line. Were you surprised at all that there was unanim unanimous support in, in the committee? I was. And, and, and surprise wouldn't be the t word I would totally use. I was honored. Uh, to be able to, to see this bill cross the finish line. I know that this bill sits on the shoulders of many uh, who have tried to, to move this legislation. And, you know, I just want to make sure to, to honor that work that's been put, you know, into this bill and continue to, to see this bill hopefully get across the finish line this time and we really make this bill and we remove this unconstitutional language that still exists in our penal code. I do want to ask you because there was opposition during the hearing from some groups and you amended the language to keep portions of current law that say, quote, homosexuality is not a lifestyle acceptable to the general public. Why did you agree to that? Well, I think that, you know, Rome wasn't made in a day. And, and we have to take the wins that we can and keep on fighting each and every day uh, for rights uh, for our communities. And that was just an example of, um, you know, that, where that needed to happen. And so I was definitely willing to negotiate on the language, but we'll continue to fight uh, to make sure that we, can t we completely remove that language uh, in future legislative sessions. Yeah, we'll see and we'll continue to watch where that bill goes. I do want to get your take on um, the fact that your the vote on your bill comes as legislation that we just heard about is also advancing uh, banning gender affirming medical treatments for minors, criminalizing drag shows, uh, to name a few. I mean, why do you think there's been support for your bill? And we talk about the unconstitutional um, place that it is in right now, but while these other bills targeting the LGBTQ community are, are moving and moving pretty rapidly. If I can be honest, I feel like some of these bills have unfortunately used children as political pawns to attack the LGBTQ community. Whether we talk about libraries, we talk about health care, or, or we talk about the other issues that are happening that with some of these bills uh, that are moving through uh, the legislative body right now, it's all centered on using kids to justify the harm that this bill will cause, not only to our children, but also to many families who are fighting for the lives of their children and having these critical and very hard conversations about what their children need right now. And I think it's very important uh, that we see past that, we see past um, the rhetoric that has been used on some of these bills and we continue uh, to bring the truth forward and make sure that voters uh, continue to have their, their voices heard just like we've seen with the rally this weekend uh, where thousands of LGBTQ people and their families and allies came out to show that Texans, LGBTQ Texans are here and these bills are very, very harmful. Representative Benton Jones, we will have to leave it there. We'll get you back on and talk about uh, how that bill is advancing that we first talked about and some of these other ones. Thank you so much for your time. I really Wonderful. appreciate you coming in studio. Thank you for having me. Texas lawmakers are considering a bill to end identity-based bullying in Texas schools. The proposal would expand state policy on bullying in schools that occurs due to the victim's race, sexuality, gender, religion, or other identity. It would also strengthen requirements for reporting, investigating, and handling such incidents for the students involved and their parents. Because when a student no longer feels safe or welcome in the classroom, we have failed as a state. Under the bill, districts would be responsible for publishing an annual report on their website with the number of incidents and investigations of bullying. The Texas judge who delivered a controversial ruling on abortion pills did not disclose a law review article he wrote to the U.S. Senate during his judicial nomination process. According to the Washington Post, Post Matthew Kaczmarek removed his name from an article that criticized transgender care and abortion protections on religious grounds before his hearings. By replacing his name with the names of two colleagues at a religious freedom-focused law firm, Kazmarek ensured the article would not be brought up during the nomination process. By law, the Senate Judiciary Committee requires nominees to disclose all published work. And Judge Kazmarek's decision to place restrictions on access to an abortion drug is before the Supreme Court now. The case is the most significant abortion-related dispute since Roe v. Wade was overturned last summer, and a decision could come this week. John Lawrence reports. Are we going to back down? Numerous abortion rights rallies were held over the weekend, including in Washington, D.C. Extreme anti-abortion judges are attempting to steal our bodily autonomy. And Los Angeles, where Vice President Kamala Harris made a surprise appearance. 
When you attack the rights of women in America, you are attacking America. These protests come days after a Texas judge suspended the FDA's decades-old approval of the abortion pill, Mifepristone. Kind of assertion that the principal basis of the uh, court case in Texas was about the safety. And I think specifically it said that it was supposed to, the accelerated pathway was supposed to approve a drug to treat an illness. It is a stretch to call a pregnancy an illness. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito extending a lower court's hold on the ruling at least until Wednesday night to allow the justices to fully examine the issue. In the meantime, sides remain drawn. In my state, we are a pro-life state. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a legislation, we have legislation which is far more pro-life than it is in, say, California. Uh, but the Californians keep their law and we keep our law and that's the way it's going to work out nationally. If any Republican thinks that voters have uh, simmered down on right. the abortion issue, they are wrong. It's going to, uh, that, that is going to continue uh, well into the next presidential race. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas says he plans to amend his financial disclosure forms to include a 2014 real estate deal with Dallas-based GOP mega-donor Harlan Crow. Thomas has been facing criticism after a report found he took multiple undisclosed luxury trips with Crow for decades. Crow gave Thomas and his family more than $130,000 for a property and claims he hoped to turn it into a museum. Under federal law, justices and other officials are required to report real estate transactions of more than $1,000. According to CNN, Thomas's mother also still lives at the home. North Texas Republican Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne's campaign says money from a joint fundraising effort with New York Representative George Santos never arrived. According to the Dallas Morning News, Van Dyne joined forces last year with Santos to raise more than $11,000. Santos's former treasurer reported the committee sent thousands to her campaign, but Van Dyne's campaign says they never received it. The House Ethics Committee is investigating Santos for biographical falsehoods. We reached out to Van Dyne's campaign spokesperson. They told us they had no comment. Still to come on Capitol tonight, a state spending standoff. How a Senate passed plan just sent the two chambers into high stakes negotiations. Plus new details of alleged misconduct, the latest accusations against a state lawmaker. Welcome back. Let's get a check now of some of the other political stories making headlines across the state. The Texas Senate approved a $308 billion budget plan today. Senators want to add $5 billion for schools that would pay for teacher pay raises and includes costs associated with offering parents private school subsidies. The plan also sets aside $16.5 billion for property tax cuts. It also contains $10 billion to fund Lieutenant Governor Patrick's priority bill of addressing the electric grid. The House and Senate now head into high-stakes negotiations to work out their different plans. A bill in the state Senate could penalize Texans who make multiple complaints to environmental regulators. Under the legislation, someone could be fined for making three or more complaints in a calendar year to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality if those complaints don't result in state action. The CEQ would be responsible for deciding when to pursue fines and how much to charge. In a complaint against State Representative Brian Slayton alleges he had sexual relations with an intern. The complaint was made by a Capitol staffer and first reported by the Quorum Report. Slayton has been accused of inviting the intern to his condo in Austin and giving her alcohol even though she's under 21. Slayton's attorney called those claims outrageous and false. He has not commented on the newest allegations. Let's bring in the Quorum Report's Harvey Kromberg now. Harvey, good to see you as always. Um, has there have been better circumstances. <laughs> sure, uh, for sure. And has Representative Slayton or his attorney, as we just mentioned, we hadn't heard anything about this latest complaint, but have you guys gotten any response on it? No, of course. It's uh, been crickets, essentially. But uh, uh, when we got a copy of the complaint, um, uh, what was unique about it and somewhat different from other, other exercises like this is it was reported by the witness. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, unless the witness is in some way uh, damaged or proven to be untruthful. Um, uh, normally you want to take a lot of deep breaths before there, uh, there's a, uh, an accusation like this, but the fact that it, it, came, it was volunteered by a witness who tried to discourage the activity um, suggests that there's some pretty serious repercussions coming. 
Yeah, so this is with the House General Investigating Committee. They're looking into this. I mean, what could come of it? What, what authority does this committee have? Uh, well, nothing legal, but by House rules, they could call for the expulsion of, um, of Representative Slayton. Um, they, uh, there's a lot of intermediary steps they could do in, in lieu of that, but uh, considering the gravity of the charges and the fact that uh, um, uh, his most conservative colleagues, he's a very conservative right. member, um, uh, and of course is you know, self-professed morality police. Um, a couple of his colleagues have already called for his resignation and it could turn into a groundswell. He's been back at the Capitol, I mean, since yes, all of this has. and has been participating. I mean, has there been any kind of confrontations or anything that you've seen in terms of how he's conducted himself? And Not that I've seen, but I, even his desk mate is doing his best to avoid him at the moment. Hmm. So um, there's some conversation, but it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, uh, I'll just say the collegiality has sort of evaporated around yeah. him, and it's mostly an eye-rolling kind of experience right now. I want to turn to uh, last week we talked about Governor Abbott pl pledging to pardon Daniel Perry shortly after he was convicted of, of murdering an Austin protester. Abbott at the time cited self-defense, um, but since his initial request, new evidence shows Daniel Perry made racist comments and regularly made clear his desire to kill pr protesters. I mean, bad move for Abbott to jump into this so, so quickly, and do you anticipate any kind of action now that these, this new evidence has come to light? It was worse than a bad move. It was humiliating because he was snapping he was responding to having been towel popped by Tucker Carlson and this is not the first time that uh, Tucker Carlson has made the governor um, uh, respond uh, without judgment and in this case uh, the, the Perry had not yet been sentenced uh, there were no appeals processes uh, but uh, uh, he said uh, the governor is admonished by Tucker Carlson who in, to change the subject slightly we had this Dominion lawsuit going on against Fox News hmm. Uh, we know that Tucker Carlson deliberately, I'll say, misled his audience on a number of issues that have been do that he documented in his own uh, texts. And for the governor to be so responsive to somebody with so little credibility um, uh, really puts a lot of his other judgments in question. Uh, they haven't walked it back yet, uh, to my knowledge, anyway. Um, and do you frankly, think he does? No, this governor never admits he's wrong or made a mistake. It would, um, at least I'm, I've never encountered an admission of having made a mistake, but that would be the appropriate thing to do in this case. The rush to judgment undermines law enforcement, it undermines the rule of law, and it undermines any credibility he ha his judgment has going forth. Yeah, and, and it'll be interesting. I mean, I guess it would be now in the hands of the parole board and kind of how they could uh, act on this. Well, it would be nice to have him sentenced before it goes sure. to the parole board. Right. That's uh, um and uh, a jury sat there for days listening to evidence and for the governor to somewhat imperiously uh, parachute in and, um, and in order to make points with Fox News, which is essentially all this was, uh, it, I would say is embarrassing. Well, we'll see how all of this plays out. Harvey Kronberg, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much. My pleasure. President Biden is set to appoint a North Texas judge to serve on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Irma Carrillo Ramirez would be the first Hispanic woman to serve on that court. It's based in New Orleans, but here's federal appeals from Texas. Senators Ted Cruz and John Cornyn have both voiced su their support for Ramirez. Cruz and Cornyn both sit on the Senate Judiciary Committee, which has a say in judicial appointees. Still to come on Capitol tonight, Congress returns to Washington with questions about an ailing senator's future, why some lawmakers want to temporarily replace her. Welcome back. The fight over the U.S. debt limit grows on Capitol Hill. Today, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said the House will vote to raise the debt ceiling in the coming weeks, but for only one year and tied to spending cuts. The plan would include a rollback on domestic and non-defensive spending levels. In response, the White House rejected the idea, calling it a dangerous economic hostage taking. Treasury officials expect the U.S. to hit the debt limit as early as this summer. 
Congress is back in session after a two-week recess. As lawmakers returned, so did questions about the future of ailing California Senator Dianne Feinstein, who's been out with shingles for two months. Because of her absence, Democrats have been unable to confirm the president's judicial nominees. Arena Diamante has the latest from Capitol Hill. The Senate will come to order. Congress returned to Washington on Monday after a two-week recess. Minority Leader Mitch McConnell was back after treatment for a concussion. And Democratic Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania returned after treatment for depression. Welcome back, Senator. However, the oldest senator, 89-year-old Democrat Dianne Feinstein of California, remains sidelined by shingles. She hasn't been in Washington since mid-February. After a request from Feinstein, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he hopes to temporarily fill her spot on the powerful Judiciary Committee in order to keep advancing President Joe Biden's judicial nominees. I spoke to her. She's hopeful she's going to return soon. I am hopeful she's going to return soon. We should have a temporary replacement until she does. We hope Republicans will join us in that. Schumer said he plans to talk to McConnell soon, and the Democratic caucus is still discussing who the best choice will be. But the party faces the challenge of finding 10 Republican votes to allow this temporary replacement. At least three Republican senators have publicly signaled their opposition. This is, it turns out, unprecedented. Over the years, senators from both sides, as I indicated a moment ago, have needed time away due to various health issues. Never, not once, have we allowed temporary substitutes on committees. And now is not the time to start. Right now, because of Senator Feinstein's absence, the Senate Judiciary Committee has been deadlocked, with 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans delaying votes and hampering Biden's efforts to add more of his nominees to the federal bench. In Washington, Rena Diamante, Capitol Tonight. Rena, thank you, and that is all the time that we have tonight. We're back again tomorrow with the latest in Texas politics. Until then, thanks for watching. Stay safe and have a great night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. And for more refreshing stories about your community, click the subscribe button right over here. You can also download our Spectrum News app to get live news coverage, weather alerts, and more wherever you are. And don't forget to tune in to Channel 55 on DISH and DirecTV for live local reporting every single day. We'll see you then.